to the Virgo Potenz YouTube channel. If you enjoy this video, I invite you to visit the Virgo Potenz website at virgopotenz.org. Virgo Potenz has articles, traditional Latin Mass resources, transcribed sermons, prayers in English and Latin, narrated videos of the Doloros Passion of Our Lord Jesus Christ by Blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich, and a spiritual warfare page. I offer the content on the website and YouTube channel for free, but this work is a full-time apostolate and your support is needed. Please prayerfully consider supporting my work by praying for me, becoming a patron of Virgo Potenz on Patreon, and or by purchasing one of my eBooks. If you'd prefer to give me a one-time contribution, I suggest that you do so by buying one of my eBooks. Links to my eBooks as well as to Patreon can be found at virgopotenz.org. May the Virgin Most Powerful guide and protect you. Our Lord's Flight to Egypt by St. Bonaventure The following Virgo Potenz production is a narrated video of chapters 12 to 13 from The Life of Christ by St. Bonaventure, narrated by Tony Capo Bianco. This translation of the text of The Life of Christ by St. Bonaventure is in the public domain. All of the pictures used in this production are also in the public domain. The Life of Christ by St. Bonaventure Chapter 12 Of Our Lord's Flight into Egypt As they were pursuing their journey towards Nazareth, not as yet knowing the divine counsels, and that Herod was planning the death of the child Jesus, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, and bade him flee into Egypt with the child and his mother, because Herod sought to take away the child's life. And Joseph arose from sleep and awoke the Blessed Mother, and told her of the dream. She arose with haste, and proposed starting off at once, for her inmost soul was stirred by the angel's warning, and she would neglect nothing that might contribute to the safety of her son. Accordingly, that very night they set out towards Egypt. Observe them, and follow them in meditation. Picture them taking up the child Jesus, still asleep. Feel for them and watch intently all that passes, for there is much that is worthy of deep consideration. And first, reflect on the vicissitudes of prosperity and adversity which our Lord experienced in his own person. And when the like changes happen to you, be patient, for every mountain has a valley near it. For behold, at his birth, Christ was glorified by the shepherds as God, and then a very little while after his birth, he was circumcised, as if a sinner. Then came the wise men and honored him greatly, he all the while remaining in a stable amongst cattle, and crying like the child of any poor man. Next we find him presented in the temple and extolled by Simeon and Anna, and then he is bidden by the angel to flee into Egypt. You may discover in his life many instances of a similar alternation, which, with a little adaptation, may provide us with instruction. When, therefore, you are receiving comfort, look out for affliction, and when afflicted, expect comfort. We ought not, then, to be elated by the one, nor depressed by the other. For the Lord sprinkles our sorrows with consolations, to sustain hope, lest we should be overborne, and he sends afflictions to keep us humble, that being reminded of our misery, we might always stand in fear. Let us consider how all these things were done by our Lord for our instruction, and that Satan might not recognize him. In the second place, with regard to divine benefits and consolations, observe that he who experiences them ought not to set himself up against him who does not experience them, and he who does not experience them ought not to yield to dejection, nor yet to envy. I ask you to notice that the angel held converse with Joseph and not with the Blessed Mother, although she was so much the greater of the two. Further, when we see that Joseph, so great in the sight of God, was vouchsafed an angelic visit, not openly but in a dream, ought we to be ungrateful and murmur when we are favored with the gifts of God, although it may be they are not bestowed in the way we would have them. Thirdly, consider how the Lord permits his people to be troubled by persecutions and tribulations, for great indeed must have been the trial to the Blessed Mother and to Joseph, 
to find that they sought to take away the child's life. What news could be more painful? It was, I repeat, a great trial to them, for although they knew that he was the Son of God, yet their natural feelings could not but be disturbed, and prompt them to cry out, O Lord God Almighty, why is it necessary that thy son should thus flee into Egypt? Art thou not able to defend him here? Moreover, there was additional trial in this, that they were obliged to take refuge in a distant and unknown country to travel on rough roads when unfit to bear fatigue, the Blessed Virgin, because of her youth, and Joseph on account of his age. The child, also himself, whom they carried, was hardly two months old, and they had to dwell in a strange land in a state of extreme poverty. All these things form a very real trial. You then, when you are tried, have patience and do not expect to be exempt from trials from which neither Christ himself nor his mother were dispensed. Fourthly, consider his benignity. See how soon and how patiently he suffers persecution and banishment from his native country and so meekly yields to the fury of the oppressor rather than destroy him in a moment. Profound indeed is this humility and great this patience. He will not retaliate or attempt to injure his enemy, but avoids his snares by withdrawing from him. We should act in the same way towards such as abuse us, despitefully use us, and persecute us. Instead of seeking to revenge ourselves upon them, let us assume the attitude of patience, avoid their fury, and what is more, pray for them, as our Lord teaches elsewhere in the Gospel. The Lord then fled from the face of his slave, or so to speak more truly, the devil's slave. His mother so tender and young, and St. Joseph so advanced in years, carried the divine child through a wild, dark, woody, uneven, lonely, tedious road, a journey which would be twelve or fifteen days post for a courier to accomplish, but which they would require two months or more to perform. For they traveled, tradition says, through that desert through which the children of Israel passed, and in which they wandered forty years. But how could they carry provisions with them? Where to, and in what way, could they find rest at night and shelter? For there are very few houses to be found in that desert. Feel pity for them, then, for this journey must have been painful, toilsome, and long, both to themselves and to the child Jesus. Go in spirit with them, and help them to carry the child, and desire to minister to them in whatever way may be in your power. It ought not to seem a hardship to bear some affliction for ourselves, when so much has been borne for us by others, and by what others, and so often. But concerning what happened in the desert and on the way, I will not dwell, because few of those details are well authenticated. When they entered into Egypt, all the idols of that country are said to have fallen in pieces, as Isaiah had prophesied. They journeyed, it is said, as far as Heliopolis, and there, renting a little house, they dwelt for seven years, as strangers and foreigners, in a poor and needy condition. And here there is scope for many beautiful, pious, and tender reflections. Consider attentively what follows. Whence, and in what manner, did they gain their livelihood for so long a time? Did they do nothing but beg? It is said that the Virgin gained what was necessary for herself and son by her distaff and needle, by sewing and weaving, and thus this queenly mother and lover of poverty passed her time. Much, indeed, in every way did they love poverty, and preserved their affection for it, unimpaired even to the end of their lives. Perhaps she went from house to house asking for work, for how should it become known in the neighborhood that she wanted employment, unless she herself made it known, for the women who had work to be done could not have divined her wish to undertake it. And when Jesus began to be about five years of age, might he not have carried messages for his mother, and gone about in quest of work for her, for she could have had no one else to go on errands? And again, might he not have taken back the work when done, and waited for part of the money to be paid? How would they both blush, the child Jesus, the Son of the Most High God, in being sent, and the mother in sending him? 
But what if sometimes, when he had given up the work and asked for payment, some proud, contentious, and abusive woman insulted him, taking from his hands his mother's labors, and then driving him without payment from the doors, so that he arrived home empty-handed? How many and how great insults are offered to poor strangers, all of which the Lord came on earth not to avoid, but to undergo? What if sometimes he returned home hungry, as children become, and asked for bread which his mother was unable to give him? What must have been the anguish of her soul on these and similar occasions? She would comfort her son with tender words, and labor to gain food for him, and perchance sometimes secretly withdraw a little from her own share to reserve it for him. These and similar incidents in the infancy of Jesus you may meditate upon, as I have suggested. The thoughts which I have given you should extend and work out, become little with the little one, and not contemning little matters which some may think too puerile for meditation. These little things seem to me capable of helping devotion, increasing love, inflaming fervor, exciting compassion, strengthening purity and simplicity, nourishing solid lowliness and poverty, preserving familiarity with virtues, leading us to imitate them, and of stimulating hope. We cannot lift ourselves up to the high things of God, but the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Such subjects of meditation do away with pride, weaken covetousness, and confound curiosity. Do you see, then, how much good may be derived from these considerations? Become, as I have already said, little with the little one, and grow with his growth, but always without prejudice to humility. Go after him whithersoever he goes, and live ever in his presence." But have you yet realized how laborious their poverty must have been, how great their bashfulness? And if they were obliged to seek food by manual labor, what shall we say of clothing? What, too, about furniture, for instance, beds and other household conveniences? Think you that they had too of anything, or anything superfluous, or anything only for ornament? No, such things are contrary to poverty, and although the Blessed Virgin might have had them, as a lover of poverty, she would not. Or again, do you imagine that with her needle, or in other ways, she employed her time in making embroidery which might minister to the love of dress? Far be it from her. Such employments suit those who have time to waste. She was, indeed, in too great necessity to spend time in vanities, Neither would she have done so if her circumstances had been different, for this is a pernicious form of idleness, and especially in these our times. And would you know why? Here then, first because by this time which was given to be used for the glory of God is spent upon trifles contrary to that end, for this curious kind of work takes up more time than it is worth, which is itself a considerable evil. Secondly, because it is apt to minister to vanity in those who do it. Oh, how often do they look at it, turn it over in their mind, and reflect how this or that should be, even when their fingers are not at work upon it. And even when they should be occupied with divine things, their mind is running on the beauty of their workmanship, on the satisfaction they feel, and on the renown they will get from it. Thirdly, because these things are an occasion of pride to those for whom they are made, for with such oil the flame of pride is fed. Plain and simple garments foster a spirit of lowliness, the opposite feed pride. Fourthly, because they are the means of withdrawing the soul from God, for, according to St. Gregory, the more a soul delights in earthly things, the more it is weaned from the love of heavenly. Fifthly, because of the lust of the eyes, one of the three sources of sin, to which all sins concerning the world are reduced, for such vanities can be of no other use but for the eyes vainly to feed upon. For, as often as any one feasts his eyes with such vanities, whether worker, bearer, or wearer, so often does that person offend God. Sixthly, 
because in many other ways such things are a snare and cause of falling. For the sight of them may lead to many faults, such as giving a bad example, causing covetousness, envy, criticisms, murmuring, or detraction. Think, therefore, how often God is offended before this curious piece of workmanship has an end, and that for all these disastrous results the worker of it is the cause. Were I then to ask you to do such things for me, and were you to know that I should certainly be willing to make use of them, you ought not to comply, since for no cause should you consent to sin, and in every way you ought to avoid what may offend God. But how much greater is your offense, if your very motive in this work is mere complacency, a wish rather to please the creature than the Creator." For they do this who wish to be distinguished, but such works are the trappings of the world, and but abominations to God. But I wonder how any one who in purity of conscience wishes to live above the world should venture to be occupied with these trifles, and should contaminate himself with them. You see, what evils flow from these curiosities. There remains, however, one more, and that a worse one which is that curiosity is the very opposite of poverty, and besides this is the mark of a light, trifling, and inconstant mind. I have dilated upon this subject, that you may be put upon your guard. From these vanities, then, flee as from a venomous serpent, neither make them nor wear them. This, however, must not be taken as a condemnation of all beautiful workmanship, and especially does not apply to work which is to be used in divine worship, but even in that care must be taken, lest there should be some defect, either as to the affection, intention, or delight with which it is done, or as to the eagerness with which it is pursued. Of such ingenious work St. Bernard thus speaks, Tell me what good such vanities are to the body, or what benefit they are to the soul. For certainly you will find that such things do not profit men at all. They are but a frivolous, empty, puerile satisfaction, and I know no severe wish for those who, leaving peace of a sweet repose, take delight in the restlessness of such vanities, than that they should be condemned to the possession of the things after which they hankered. But let us return to the Blessed Mother in Egypt, for we have been tempted to make a long digression about this abominable vice of curiosity. Behold her again, occupied with her labors, sewing, knitting, and spinning, and see how humbly, faithfully, and perseveringly she toils, all the while taking the most diligent care of her son, and of household matters, and also finding opportunities, whenever possible, for prayer and watching." You then, with all affection, compassionate her, and consider that not even did the mother of our Lord obtain the kingdom of heaven without working for it. Perhaps it sometimes happened that some charitable matrons in the neighborhood, noticing her poverty, sent her a little relief, which she received humbly and with thankfulness. And Joseph, notwithstanding his age, worked a little at his trade as a carpenter. Look then, which you will, there is ample material for compassion. Pause a little to exercise it, then, on bended knees, ask for a blessing from the child Jesus, and in spirit bidding him, his mother, and St. Joseph, adieu, with all reverence and tears of pity, depart, not forgetting that they have to remain there as exiles from their country, without a cause for seven years, and to earn their bread in a foreign land, in the sweat of their brow. Chapter 13 of the Return of Our Lord from Egypt For seven full years God is said to have been a stranger in the land of Egypt, when the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Take the young child and his mother, and go into the land of Israel, for they are dead which sought the young child's life. And he took the young child and his mother, and returned into the land of Israel. On his arrival, he discovered that Archelaus, the son of Herod, reigned there, and he feared to go on. And through a second admonition from the angel, he retired into Galilee, to the city of Nazareth. His return was about the Feast of the Epiphany. According to the martyrology, it was on the second day. Here again you see, for I have touched on this before, how the Lord gives his consolations and revelations piecemeal, and not all at once according to the fullness of our desires. 
You may notice this from two circumstances. First, because the revelation came not openly, but in a dream. Secondly, because not on one occasion, but on two, the angel instructed him as to where he was to go. According to an old commentary, God did this because our certainty is increased by the repetition of the vision. But whether this be so or not, we ought to esteem highly every the least revelation and be thankful for it, knowing that he always disposes all things in the way he sees to be best for us. But now let us gather in our thoughts upon the return of our Lord and give our whole attention to it, for it is a subject most suitable for devout meditation. Return then in spirit to Egypt for the sake of visiting the child Jesus. Perhaps you will find him out of doors in company with other children. Depict him as a child running up to you, for he is affable, kindly, and courteous. But you fall on your knees and kiss his feet and take him up into your arms and rest a while with him. Perhaps he will say to you, We have permission to return to our country, and tomorrow we have to leave this place. You have come at a good time, for you can join us on our homeward journey. To which quickly respond that you will be overjoyed to do so, that you wish to follow him wheresoever he goes, and that your delight is in his society. I have already allowed that such points as these may seem puerile to some, yet frequent meditation upon them will yield much fruit and prepare the way for higher things. Afterwards, you can imagine that he will lead you to his mother, who will honor you with a courteous reception. Pay her and her holy and aged spouse the attention which is due, and rest with them. On the following morning, when they are ready to depart, you will see some charitable matrons, and also men, come to accompany them beyond the gates of the city, on account of their peaceful and pious mode of life, whilst among them. For it may be they had spoken beforehand to their neighbors of their departure for some days, for it was not fitting that they should leave unexpectedly and, as it were, by stealth, a mode of departure which they had adopted when they came into Egypt. But then they had a reason for it, for the life of the child was in danger. And now they are setting out. Joseph goes before with the men, and the Blessed Virgin follows at some distance with the matrons. Take then, in spirit, the child by the hand, and go with him before his mother, for she will not suffer him out of her sight. When they had passed the gate, Joseph would no longer permit them to accompany him, when perhaps one of them, who was rich, taking pity on their poverty, called the child Jesus to him and gave him something for their journey. The child, though ashamed, accepted it. We can imagine him, for the love of poverty, holding out his hand and bashfully taking the money and returning thanks for it. And then others began to give him something also, the matrons calling him and doing the same. His mother, too, was no less abashed, yet she also humbly acknowledged the gifts. Do you then compassionate them? For he it is whose is the earth and the fullness thereof who made choice of so rigorous a poverty and such narrow circumstances for himself, his mother, and his foster father. How brightly does their poverty shine in all its holiness! How does it draw us to the love and practice of it? At last, having returned thanks to the company, they wish them goodbye and pursue their journey. But how will the child Jesus bear the fatigue of this journey, being yet of tender age? It will be a greater trial than the journey when he came into Egypt, for then he was so little that he was easily carried, but now he is too big to be carried and too little to walk. It may have been that some good neighbors gave or lent and asked for him to ride on. O beautiful and delicate youth, king of heaven and earth, what labors didst thou undergo for us, even in thy earliest years? Well hath the prophet said in thy person, I am poor and in labors from my youth. Great indeed are the privations, incessant the toil, and countless the bodily hardships thou didst assume for our sakes. Thou seemest to have hated thyself out of love for us. Surely this one labor on which we are now meditating should have sufficed to redeem us. 
Take up then the boy Jesus, and in spirit put him on the ass, conduct him trustily, and when he wants to dismount, receive him joyfully into your arms, and hold him a little while, at least till his mother comes up, who may be imagined to walk a little more slowly and evenly. Then the child will go to her, and the reception of him will be to her a great repose. On they go, and through the desert by which they came. They pass, during this journey, often excite compassion for them, for they have but little rest. See them, how fatigued they are, and worn out with toil both by day and night. When they reach the confines of the desert, there they may have met John the Baptist, who had already begun to lead a penitential life though said to be free from sin. It is thought that the place on the banks of Jordan where John baptized is that over which the children of Israel passed when they came from Egypt through this very desert, and that nigh to that place in this desert John did penance. It is quite possible, if this were the case, that the boy Jesus, when he passed that way on his return, might find him there. Meditate, then, on the joy which would surely accompany such a meeting, and see them remaining for a while, with the Baptist partaking of his rough food, and, after the sweetness of spiritual refreshment, bidding him adieu. And you, at meeting and parting, show respect for the saint, in spirit embracing his feet, seeking his blessing, and striving to imitate him. For great is that child, and very wonderful even from his cradle." He was the first hermit, the founder and model of all who choose the religious life. He was most pure, a very great preacher, more than a prophet, and a glorious martyr. Then the travelers crossed Jordan and called at the house of Elizabeth, where there was great joy and mutual congratulations. Then it was that Joseph, on hearing that Archelaus, the son of Herod, reigned in Judea, was filled with fear, and being warned by an angel in a dream, withdrew to Galilee, to the city of Nazareth. Behold, we have brought back the child Jesus from Egypt, and upon his return the sisters and other relatives and friends of the Blessed Virgin all ran to visit them. But they remained in Nazareth, and lived a life of poverty. From this time to the twelfth year of his age, nothing is recorded of the child Jesus. There is a tradition, however, and it is not improbable, that the fountain is still there out of which he used to draw water for his mother. For the lowly Lord perhaps did services of this kind for her, for she had no other to serve her. Here, too, you can imagine that St. John the Evangelist came with his mother, she being the Blessed Virgin's sister, and he being about five years old. For it is reported of him that he died sixty-seven years after our Lord's Passion, in the ninety-eighth year of his age. And therefore, at the time of Christ's Passion, when our Lord was thirty-three or a little more, St. John was thirty-one. St. John, then, would be about five when our Lord was seven years old on his return from Egypt. Behold, then, the children standing together and conversing as our Lord may enable you. For this was that disciple whom afterwards Jesus loved, with the love of friendship. End of chapters 12 to 13 from the Life of Christ by St. Bonaventure. Narrated by Tony Capobianco. Bianco.